All right, if I could pull your attention back here for just a little bit longer, we have a lovely final panel. And now that we are fortified with some coffee, I think we should begin. Thank you so much. I'm just going to keep us moving because we are, of course, behind schedule a bit. But our next speaker is Mata Dimakapulu, an assistant professor in American literature at National and Kapostrian University in Athens. She is associate editor of Synthesis, an Anglophone Journal of Comparative Literary Studies. And her publications include articles on John Ashbery, Max Ernst, and Joseph Cornell. She's also co-editor of the volume, The Letter of the Law, Literature, Justice, and the Other. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you, Sire, and I also want to thank the organizers and the Terra Foundation, and I hope that events of this kind may also be an incentive uh, for sort of mutual dialogue and that it will trigger interest in uh, students in Anglophone contexts to look at traditions other than their own and work with scholarships produced in languages other than their own. There's an immense gain uh, in there, I can assure you. So, the... Should we all get this power rather wrong? Can you? Okay, never mind. Hmm? Ah, it's behind. Okay. So this uh, this paper works. Uh, this is a bit works along similar lines as uh, Philip's paper yesterday. Uh, and it's essentially an attempt to look at uh, writings by artists and a poet, uh, less so as elaborating aesthetic theories, but uh, rather about their qualities as texts, and see them in relation to the intellectual climate uh, of the late 60s and early 70s uh, that we broadly uh, came to call post-structuralism and to take post-structuralism less as an interpretative tool but rather as uh, containing in a way the concerns uh, that and the preoccupations that those texts also express. Uh, the seeing post-structuralism as a climate rather than as a way to uh, produce a reading is also something that Marty J had recently uh, very nicely stated in Songs of Experience, uh, where he actually alerts us to the uh, convergence of the uh, to the convergence of the theory, the theoretical blueprint, and the object of our inquiry. Uh, I quote, the ruthless dissolution of the integrated self and stress on the constitutive uh, importance of language accompanied by a deep suspicion of naive notions of lived experience defined largely the appropriation of structuralist and post-structuralist theory in the Anglo-American Academy. Uh, end of the quote. So Robert Smithson's Vito Conchis and Bernadette Mayer's early work are cases in point. Uh, their uneven and unclassifiable uh, textures may be rethought as grounds that also contain an investment uh, in human experience and as spaces in which reflexivity and the uh, capacious notion of text and language uh, and the dissolution of the integrated self get entangled rather than uh, being mutually exclusive modalities. So as per uh, Carolyn, in the manner of Carolyn, part one, from language to the land and back again. Uh, from, it's really microphone fright, so from the crystal land to the spiral jetty, Smithson's reflections on art intersect with meanderings into hybridized cultural landscapes and the inner experiences that they may trigger. With a mixture of uh, seriousness and parody, the crystal land documents the artist's visit of mineral-rich quarries. The idiosyncratic account of the outing is also a singularly encrastic text. Uh, his fellow artist Donald Judd's 
pink plexiglass box is the pretext for seeing the American suburban landscape also as a landscape of the mind. I can't quite get the arrows. Well, it seems never, we go and lost, but never mind. I'll just read it. So the entire landscape has a mineral presence. From the shiny chrome diners to glass windows of shopping centers, a sense of the crystalline prevails. Fragmentation, corrosion, decomposition, disintegration, an infinity of surfaces spread in every direction. A chaos of cracks surrounded us. So, uh, as I said, those writings, I think, combine a singular ekphrasis triggered by his own and his fellow artists' works, and at the same time, map a very personal trajectory. From the most uh, poetic William Carlos Williams indebted uh, text, Monuments of Passaic, New Jersey, to the spiral jetty, the text uh, of 1972, a lyrical meditative uh, attitude gets combined with irrationalism and a perplexing, perplexing playful literalism that is also the case with Vito Conchi's texts. So, the sedimentation of the mind, earth projects. Uh, in this text, natural processes become metaphors for the process of perception. This is uh, the case with the aphorism that opens the text. The earth's surface and the figments of the mind have a way of disintegrating into discrete regions of art. Various agents, both fictional and real, somehow trade places with each other. One cannot avoid muddy thinking when it comes to earth projects, or what I will call abstract geology. Regardless of how seriously uh, we are supposed to take uh, Robert Smithson's abstract geology, uh, it's not exactly a condition of empathy uh, or correspondence in that exit. We can uh, read it as a way for the artist to conceptualize the texture of the land through the art and vice versa and to establish a reciprocity between himself and geography or the idea of geography as well while traveling, thinking or working with the earth. Uh, in the longer exit that I want us to look at next, Uh, I think that a literary critic could read a uh, could read a fairly or could construct a fairly eclectic intertext uh, out of this. So one's mind and the earth are in a const constant state of erosion. Mental rivers wear away, abstract banks, brain waves undermine cliffs of thought, ideas decompose into stones of unknowing, and conceptual crystallizations break apart into deposits of gritty reason. Vast moving faculties occur in the geological miasma and they move in the most physical way. This movement seems motionless, yet it crashes the landscape of logic under glacial reveries. This slow flowage makes one conscious of the turbidity of thinking. Slump, debris, slides, avalanches all take place within the cracking limits of the brain. The entire body is pulled into the cerebral sediment where particles and fragments make themselves known as solid consciousness. A bleached and fractured world surrounds the artist. To organize this mess of corrosion into patterns, grids, and subdivisions is an aesthetic process that has scarcely been touched. Uh, now, by way of uh, the intertext that one could contrast, the uh, obvious and more uh, contemporary connection would be the writings of his, uh, of his, uh, of the poet, the poets whom he knew of the second generation uh, New York school. Uh, who also use a, an, uh, lists in, uh, in an unnerving kind of way. 
Uh, one could read, of course, the uh, vagaries of Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, this is rather worthy of early surrealist poetry of the uh, kind that Desnos uh, produced, uh, as well as the uh, writers who uh, constituted, were important for a post-structuralist genealogy from Bataille to Blanchot. Uh, of course, this uh, uh, may not uh, be the case with that, although nonetheless, I think he some, uh, somewhere mentions that he has been reading Deleuze uh, or Guattari. But in any case, the, I guess, where post-structuralism comes to constitute a backdrop for this is the gratuitous, reflexive, but at the same time, fairly anxious uh, use and condensation of language. So, uh, there is another quote that I want us to look, uh, where really uh, geography, or, uh, and in a sense the ungrounding from a physical uh, geography and scientific uh, taxonomies, that's not the one, a result uh, again in Ah, no, here it is. Okay. Uh, again, verb play worthy uh, of the writings of the surrealists. Uh, so the names of minerals and the minerals themselves do not differ from each other, because at the bottom of both the material and the print is the beginning of an abysmal number of fissures. Words and rocks contain a language that follows a syntax of splits and ruptures. Look at any word long enough and you will see it open up into a series of faults, into a terrain of particles, each containing its own void. This discomforting language of fragmentation offers no easy gestalt solution. The certainties of didactic discourse are hurled into the erosion of the poetic principle. Poetry being forever lost must submit to its own vacuity. It is somehow a product of exhaustion rather than creation. Poetry is always a dying language, but never a dead language. Uh, this pronouncement on languages void and the somewhat affected contrived or lyrical dismissal of the vacuity of poetry that resists death yet persists in dying is a return, at least in a post-structuralist context, is a return to an anxiety over the inevitable work and mediation of language and seeing. In fact, in these early writings, the artist seems to be uh, oscillating between employing language and seeing in order to record the thought and the processes of his work or in order to intensify the vacuity of his own texts. Uh, a similar process is at work in the incidents of mirror travel in the uh, Yucatan, uh, where a self-aware detached uh, attitude uh, is combined with a lyrical narrative uh, and cinematic vision. Uh, and that's the last uh, excerpt. Yes. Uh, the real travel is the pretext for a narration in which the artist is recurringly pointing towards the loop or the inadequacies of conceptualism. The mirror itself is not subject to duration because it's, it is an ongoing abstraction that is always available and timeless. The reflections, on the other hand, are fleeting instances that evade measure. Space is the remains or corpse of time. It has dimensions. Objects are sham space, the excrement of thought and language. Once you start seeing objects in a positive or negative way, you're on the road to derangement. Uh, so what uh, we may read into that is the expandability of idea of space and matter uh, and eventually 
a longing for a more durable, a more reliable experience of time and thinking through language. The fascination with the land and the matter, at least in its uh, written uh, form, expression, seems to be permeated by an anxiety for investment in traces of variable proportions. The incidents of mural travel, uh, in that sense, uh, constitute a prelude to the work and the text of the spiral jetty, which, uh, again, from the point of view of a literary critic, could uh, be seen as a purposeful, intellectual, and actual flannery into a cultural and a natural geography. Uh, part two, investing in the record uh, and the inadequacies of conceptualism. Vito Conci also revolves the question of experience in his paradoxical aesthetics. In an, often in an often quoted response in a recent interview, the artist returns to the connection between linguistic play and the performing body. Contrary uh, to Smithson's anxiety or distrust before the void, a conscious idea of poetry albeit in a tongue-in-cheek manner, affirms the connection between the reflexive nature of language and experience. Uh, let's just read the first part. I, uh, I would put poetry at the bottom of a hierarchy of the arts, not because it's lesser, but because it's the base, the undercurrent, the substructure of the arts. But as a base, it's only a beginning. Poetry has nothing to do with concentration of language or distillation of language. Poetry is an attempt to get through language and arrive at a state of pre-language. It's a cry, a gasp, a screech. Some uh, pop, maybe a pop version of the Lacanian reel, but nonetheless. Uh, poetry is thinking, or maybe it's only feeling, and opposites. Poetry is uh, fluidity between opposites. Then later, poetry throws the voice into spaces, events. Poetry grows up to become a novel or a movie or music or architecture. But once a poet, always a poet. Or at least once a language user, always a language user. I don't know how to think more exactly. I don't know how to know I'm thinking except by language. I start a project by naming the conditions and playing with words, panning on these names. Or I start a project by subject, verb, object. I parse a space. I use sentence structure to plot possible movements through that space. Uh, like the figure of opacity disregards a transparent meaning in Smithson, the self-referential loop of Aconchi's early performances certainly disregard narrative and use the body as a sign that, like his early poetry, as Craig Dorkin put it, denies the transparency of signification. Yet the connection between self-reference and performance, the interface between the use of language and the use or abuse of the physical body, can be thought otherwise or in an uh, inverted way. Uh, just as language writes itself as it is being written, so does the body become both a transitive verb, to use the uh, grammatical metaphor of Akonchi himself, and a verb in the middle voice, uh, in which condition the subject is both the agent and the object of an action. Again, regardless of the degree of seriousness uh, that we may invest in the artist's statement, by defining poetry as a mediating experience and a reaching out onto the unattainable and uh, from uh, our perspective, even cliche state of pre-language, invites us to see performance as underscored by a similar longing, albeit ironically. Uh, within the voluminous archive of the artist's early projects, the material that was recently assembled in a diary of the body constitutes an important document of the artist's practice that, like Smithson's writings,
could be thought in its own right. For all its disconcerting repetitiveness and casualness, the diary of the body preserves realized and unrealized variations where the insistent uh, notation of time, place and circumstances for his pieces confers an experiential quality to linguistic play. The notes corroborate and at the same time undermine their matter of factness and provide anchoring within at least lived time. Uh, a, often a poetic quality blends with theoretical reflection or sham theoretical reflection that is refracted through the actual or at times feigned meta-language of the dictionary. I'm just uh, citing or rather showing instances of notes that uh, use the device of the dictionary. Uh, whoops. Yes, so I think, uh, so general cir circumstances, notation of, uh, a very mundane notation of place, uh, particular circumstances, the rather uh, trivial uh, evocation devising uh, of the activity, as it is called, and the developments, transitive verb, intransitive verb, copulative, active, passive, present, past, future, uh, pre uh, past perfect, future perfect, and on and on, imperative mood, gerund, infinitive, adverb, conjunction. Uh, that gives you a sense of the uh, use of taxonomy uh, rather than list, and also the use of language. The diary of the body contains notes, photographs, glosses on the activities, entries, uh, diaristic entries, journal entries of various kinds. Uh, against uh, Vito Conchi's own dismissal of the document in another text of his, and his uh, essentially relegating the document, the record, to a secondary status, the document mediates and preserves a temporality that is, I believe, of the order of narrative and not exclusively or solely of the site-specific temporality of the performance. For all their disengagement and irony, the records and the notes have a documentary value. Preserving and mediating the experiential substance of the artist's practice, the, the material compels uh, our retrospective reading and viewing to break through the self-referential loop and establish a reflective uh, distance that the logic of performance seemed to have intended to live out. Now lastly, I want to uh, conclude with a uh, with a reference to uh, Bernadette Mayer's uh, near contemporary autobiographical text, Memory, which again is a fairly unclassifiable text. It's like a poem, a prose poem, like a stream of consciousness. One can read again, you know, all the modernist and uh, postmodernist uh, tropes, uh, I guess uh, we are all familiar with. So the text is repetitive. And it's got some, uh, if I'm allowed the paradox, it's got a sort of uninterrupted discontinuity, if that uh, can be the case. Yes, we're done. Uh, and implicates lived experience and the experiential substance of writing in ways that can be related to a conscious play with literalism and, uh, and better language and Smithson's pithy and dense uh, eclecticism. We'll skip the, uh, although you can look at it and... Uh, I, we can just look at the text, whoops, which we lost anyway. So uh, the the just you know what the the, the, the text is cluttered. It's kind of uh, both cluttered and uh, gives a sense of being depleted. Uh, all kinds of mundane contingencies, proper names, private incidents, essentially things of all sorts parade. Uh, in the pages of that text. And my mayor too enmeshes personal experience, entwines personal experience and thoughts uh, with a vast uh, textual imagine traversed space. Uh, and the, what this text also does, it kind of deflects the density 
uh, that we associate uh, with poetic language, to include the, in its artlessness the, uh, the uh, mul multifariousness of the everyday. Now, to conclude, the, the value of those uh, early experiments in text uh, rests, uh, I think, in their being documents uh, uh, that engage not only the tension between referentiality and signification, but also the possibility of investing texts and images with meanings. Uh, artless and certainly uneven, such texts point to a gap between the lived textuality and the visual against the grain of the anti-representational bias and the self-referential politics of the works uh, themselves. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Martha. Our next speaker will be Anna kraftchik Vaskajuska. <laughs> in the neighborhood, who is assistant professor of the Department of English Philology at the University of Armia and Missouri in Olsztyn, Poland. She has published articles on William Gibson's prose, on the history and challenges of the discipline of American studies, on book illustrations, on, on pop and visual cultural phenomenon, and her current research focuses on film and TV adaptation and cultural representations of the city. So thank you for sharing your research with us today. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, like other participants, I'd like to thank um, the organizers of this fabulous event and the Terra Foundation for giving me the opportunity to be part of, of this thing. Now you'll see whether the invitation made sense. <laughs> so. So there will be adapting to consider. Okay, I'll try to, to handle. Hand All right, I'll, I'm going to give you. Okay, I'll start talking right now. <laughs> so my presentation will be devoted to a person who is known primarily as a film critic, but also an artist. And you'll see hopefully uh, his photo uh, in a moment. And I think that this uh, photograph will also uh, remind you of the very basic fact, namely that Mani Faber, uh, the protagonist, is very dead. <laughs> but uh, I'm just saying this because Mani Faber is not the only intelligent and brilliant uh, film critic who is dead, right? What I'm trying to say is that presentations like, well, every presentation takes part in a specific social cultural moment. So the moment for us now, for us people who are suckers enough to watch films obsessively and write about them, um, the moment is not a very good one uh, because all those, let's say, um, old generation critics, they are slowly dying. And that, there aren't that many people to replace them in terms of skills that they brought to the very, you know, tricky business of reviewing uh, films. Now I'm starting to panic. <laughs> but um, so, so basically, um, it's true that, oh yeah, there you go. See, uh, I really didn't want to offend Mr. Money Faber. I just wanted, wanted you to sort of realize what's going on. Recently, we had uh, pretty spectacular cases of... Uh, of critics who left us, uh, among them uh, the likes of Stanley Kaufman, um, Roger Ebert, who was very much a mainstream uh, critic, a thing that cannot really be said about Mani Faber. Uh, and then we had very recently uh, news of, of the death of Richard Corley. So it's like they are dying away and uh, we're not sure what, uh, what's going to, <laughs> who's going to, to follow um, who's going to continue their work. Uh, Mani Faber uh, did have a few, uh, let's say, zealous disciples among them, uh, Jonathan Rosenbaum, uh, to whom I owe actually fascination with Mani Faber uh, because it was through Jonathan Rosenbaum's uh, writings that I learned about Mani Faber. Also, Ken Jones and uh, my favorite uh, critic and uh, uh, film blogger ever, Girish Shambu. So these are people who continue to, uh, to do the great job of, of talking about him. Yes, it's personal for me. So uh, first of all, I have to admit, uh, this won't be a, you know, a dirty confession, but I'm kind of obsessed with reading reviews, 
but also with writing reviews. And uh, uh, another confession is that I did that for the past three decades, but in various forms, reviewing different things. And most of this stuff was never published, but I did publish some stuff. And, uh, you know, throughout this activity of, of reviewing things, either for my, you know, uh, private pleasure or for, for actually for, for other folks to, to see, I experienced this sort of private anxiety. Uh, private anxiety is the term used by Richard Polito, the guy who edited uh, the first complete uh, anthology of Manny Faber's uh, text. It was published, I believe, in 2009. It's a beautifully uh, edited book. Uh, so, so my anxiety as a reviewer, but also as a reader of reviews, has to do with various criteria, biases, limitations that the very genre called review uh, poses for, for us. So I, I kind of, uh, I have to say that I think a lot uh, before reviewing anything, and I'm always, I always feel inadequate when, when, when reviewing. Then there is a problem or opportunity, depends how you want to phrase it, the problem of content, I'm sorry for the misspelling of vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, and style. So um, this is also something that is pretty much uh, like the, the core problem for me. Like once you decided to insert certain content, what do you do to make it, uh, what do you do to make your readers absolutely fascinated? with whatever it is that you wrote, right? So uh, I believe Manny Faber would not have had such problems because he was simply a splendid writer. And uh, uh, last but not least, and this is the most disquieting part perhaps <laughs> about uh, reviewing, it's the context of academic writing, of research writing. So that is my problem or again an opportunity because I'm, I'm not sure how many of you have that feeling sometimes that once, uh, once you know exactly what you're, going to, um, what you're going to include in your piece of writing, uh, you start thinking about perhaps a far more important thing and you know, all those issues of, of style, the language that you're going to use in order to persuade the, the readers that you, um, that you are not only right, but that you are also brilliant. Uh, well, whatever that means. <laughs> And then there is the problem, of course, of Mr. Money Faber as someone who functions in the business or functioned, well, he still functions through his writings, through the dissemination of his ideas. But then there is the problem of, of Faber as a, uh, you know, as a critic who is supposed to attract audiences. Uh, so you, you'll see in a moment that when you read a review by Manny Faber, it doesn't necessarily mean that you, will, that you will get the necessary knowledge, namely whether to go to the cinema or not. So there is that thing to consider uh, as well. Just, it, I know that it's a horrible thing to simplify someone's life like this, you know, but I kind of wanted to stress that this was a man of many jobs, right? So carpenter and painter, then, since 1942, as a 25-year-old man, uh, he started reviewing, um, uh, reviewing films, uh, I believe, for, for the New Republic, uh, and then the, the Nation. And then, um, he, 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 was also, he can also be legitimately considered an author, a, a writer. And in 1977, he said, enough, enough of reviewing. And he, uh, and he began painting again. One more bit of information that might be of interest to you, namely the fact that he started as essentially, and again I'm simplifying, an abstract painter. But once he stopped reviewing films, his, painting cha his paintings changed completely and become uh, pretty much representational. So that is an interesting development. Um, James Hoberman uh, summed up uh, the critical activities by, uh, of Mr. Uh, Manny Faber, saying that he was playing both ends off against the middle brow, right? That's a very essential piece of information for, for Robert <laughs> concerning the, I kind of, I still don't know whether the middle brow exists, but uh, I kind of trust uh, Hoberman, uh, at least in the case of his writings about, uh, about Manny Faber. I'm not so sure about his other uh, reviews. Uh, things that are that deserve to be mentioned, and uh, f the book Negative Space, of which I, uh, you know, I won't spend uh, well, uh, probably a few seconds really um, talking about Negative Space. Um, 
And the essay, White Elephant Art versus Termite Art, which was published in 1962. Uh, by, the way, by the way, the year 1998 should not, uh, should not confuse you. Uh, originally, he published uh, that book in 1970. It's just that the edition from 1998 is kind of complete and, and uh, better edited. So uh, the one thing that I hope you will remember from my uh, strange uh, presentation is that uh, unlike many other critics, Manny Faber, uh, critics reviewers, wasn't really that big on those narrative elements which are of great importance for, for most uh, for in, in reviews. So our synopsis, characters, plot lines, it was uh, these things were mentioned peripherally, but of greater detail, uh, of greater importance for, for Mr. Faber was uh, the idea of obsessing over certain details of the film, really going deep into what uh, specific directors wanted to achieve by shooting uh, a sequence in, in this or that uh, way. So I, I find it very, very interesting. And then uh, the, the, the division itself, you know, uh, I kind of wanted to, for you to have some, for some fun, so let's have, uh, let's have those, those two lovely uh, creatures, right? But uh, basically the idea is that white, uh, I'm thinking of kind of translating those concepts into the present day reality. Like, of course, I regret the fact that Mani Faber will not review any, any other, any, uh, any film anymore, right? For obvious reasons. Uh, of course, I would love to see his face when, uh, when watching, I don't know, The Avengers, The Age of Ultron. Uh, but, but of course, he wouldn't probably, that's the thing with, with, with Faber. Faber never, never watched as many f films as other reviewers, right? Because he refused to watch certain, certain films, uh, God bless him, uh, or whatever. Uh, but um, what I'm trying to say is uh, that, um, you know, the, the, I think that if you talk about this white elephant art or elephant art, it's really about uh, the, the rough equivalent nowadays would, be, would perhaps be the so-called high concept movie. You know, all those movies that are like sure bets at the Oscars ceremonies, you know, of, of all this pretentious crap, uh, essentially. Whereas termite art would refer, he also used terms such as fungus or centipede, uh, well, human centipede, that will be yet another film that I would love Mani Faber to watch, but of course this wouldn't, this wouldn't happen ever. So, um, so there, is, there is this idea that small detail, small sensations count, right? Daring images, bug-like immersion in a small area without point or aim, and overall concentration on nailing down one moment without glamorizing it. <clears throat> I think now I have a tedious, long, long fragment, which you might read or not. <laughs> but the, the thing is uh, that um, I, I like especially the middle part of this quotation, a peculiar fact about termite, tapeworm, fungus, moss art is that it goes always forward, eating its own boundaries. So we had some geology, right? So let's have, let's have this biological... Uh, thing as well, and likely as not, leaves nothing in its path uh, other than the signs of eager, industrious, unkempt activity. The most inclusive description of the art is that termite-like, it feels its way through walls of particularization with no sign that the artist has any object in mind other than eating away the immediate boundaries of his art and turning these boundaries into conditions of the next achievement. Um, so, so there is that, uh, so there is that um, division to, uh, to consider. Now, I just, because there's, not, there's never enough time, right? Uh, but I just want to present you with a few samples of his writings, of his writings on specific uh, directors. As, as you can see, he's capable of arriving at certain generalizations. And then it's kind of interesting to see how painterly those reviews are. In fact, it's very much, you know, like talking about a landscape which is a two-dimensional landscape, but also obsession with mobility, lack of mobility, movement as, as such. This is, I think, uh, very, very interesting. And I think he actually captured the very important quality of uh, Binuel's um, uh, filmmaking uh, techniques. Uh, and again, Faber is so interesting because he noticed things that most people did not notice. Each movie is a long march through small connected events 
dragged out distressingly to the last moment, just getting the movie down the wall from a candle to a crucifix takes more time than an old silent comedy, but it is the sinister fact of a Buñuel movie that no one is going anywhere, and there is never any release at the end of the film. It's one snare after, after another, so that the people get wrapped around themselves in claustrophobic whirlpool patterns. One more thing that I, I guess needs to be emphasized, although you, you can see it uh, with your own eyes, the synesthetic uh, effect here, like appealing to various senses at the same time. This is also something that deserves uh, our attention. Then this, this hilarious thing, uh, he wrote in several places at the same time, so occasionally published stuff in film comment, for example. So at some point, you were not really sure whether this guy is praising a movie or ridiculing that, that movie. Uh, and sometimes, you know, you could argue that the reviews were sort of uh, debating, you know, <laughs> with, uh, with uh, each other. And we don't have time for, for, for very detailed discussions of that phenomenon, but it's quite hilarious. So, so there it is, you know, the fragment about Lee Marvin in, in the film uh, and uh, the fact that he hardly matters, which, which I find so, so, so funny. His block-like, snout-like nose makes itself felt. Also the silvery snake-like hair that does not look like hair. <laughs> and the implacable large-lipped mouth, right? I'm not sure that's the way you'd, uh, you'd uh, describe uh, Lee Marvin, but you, you cannot uh, fail to appreciate, you know, the, the, the dramatic flair, right, <laughs> with which this, uh, it is done here. Particular parts of his body and face are used like notes in a recurring musical score. His body stays stiff, vertical, very healthy, and sunburned, but he's not actually in the movie, right? <laughs> So now I feel like, you know, Manny Faber, please, uh, please review Rocky, for example. <laughs> so just, uh, just for our, you know, shameless pleasure. So there is that. And then um, the, this, this, this thing uh, that is also reflected in his paintings, which uh, and a few, I'm, I will show in a, uh, a few of those paintings in a moment, but um, this idea, like a swarm of ideas, that, that, that is not mine, that is, I think, that... Uh, this is the way uh, Rosenbaum described uh, his method, or, or rather lack of method, right? So you will have quite a lot of uh, items uh, mentioned uh, in those reviews, quite a lot of ideas which do not necessarily strike you as congruous, but at the same time, when you look at this overall effect, it's, it's pretty amazing. So take a look at this funny little, um, you know, uh, damning praise. <laughs> Uh, concerning Howard Hawks. Uh, and by the way, the important thing about Farber is that he sort of rediscovered uh, uh, those films for the American audiences. Suddenly, all those movies which, which were called B-movies assumed greater importance thanks to his obsessive, uh, obsessive watching. Uh, the whole movie-making system of Howard Hawks seems a secret preoccupation with Lincoln, a connection business, uh, connections business involving people, plots, and eight-inch hat brims. So it's kind of short and to the point. And then the hilarious comment uh, uh, as, as regards the steel helmet, Zach, uh, who starts the steel helmet as a helmet with a hole in it, a bit like a turtle, until the helmet <laughs> rises an inch off uh, the stubbled field to show these meager, nasty eyes slowly shifting back and forth, casing the area. It's like someone born on Torment Street between malicious and crude. I think that the, the type of uh, the, the, the stuff that he does in that review, you will probably find echoes of that style in some of the, uh, let's say, more or less pretentious reviews by uh, some of those people that I uh, already uh, mentioned. And then, just to give you an idea, because uh, again, I, I kind of thought about uh, five minutes, yeah, perfect, <laughs> about showing you a fragment of a film. But this, this uh, like, when we analyze films, we talk a lot about the so-called human figure, right? Meaning actor, essentially, the way he or she speaks, the way she looks, the way she, or he, in, in this case, both these actors constitute part, uh, uh, constitute uh, part of the scene. And then, uh, j just, to, just to remind you, uh, this is arguably Stan Wick's best comedy, and it's essentially about trying to fool this lovely guy uh, played by Mr. Fonda. Uh, so that's the comment that he has uh, 
that he has uh, about this, uh, this, this particular film and the skills that Sturges, Preston Sturges, the director of the comedy, uh, shows. And you, you can see that, uh, that uh, Faber has very specific uh, ideas as, as how to improve that, uh, that, uh, that comedy. The love scenes are shot, grouped and lit in such a way as to throw a moderate infusion of sex and sentiment into a fast-moving, brittle comedy without slowing it down. Notice again the, the painterly quality of, of talking about this, that, that film, and just... Uh, uh, just to uh, show, yeah, the, 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 it, it's that fragment, uh, uh, <laughs> essentially, when he talks about the human figures, stray items, right? Uh, someone's spiky hair, Stanwyck's quasi-Roman nose, clutter up his foreground like blocks of wood. Even dogs, horses, and lions seem to turn into stuffed props when the Sturgis camera focuses on them. And I've, uh, again, I don't remember any other review which would actually talk about uh, the the particular, the, the blocking of the human figure in this, uh, in this film. And then the switch to the so-called, to the, let's say, more representational uh, paintings is very, very interesting in the case of this artist because once he resigns, and I forgot to say that he was also a teacher, right? So he also taught, uh, taught um, you know, film history and film criticism. And if you, if you could please just, just take a look at, uh, at, uh, at a few of those paintings, you can see a lot of toys or miniatures, out of scale uh, miniatures, that are references uh, to uh, various films, right? So for example, a dandy's gesture is like a painterly comment on Howard Hawks. Um, film uh, every, and then you have you have literally uh, quotes from those uh, films. You know, uh, angels have. Uh, I think that's the title. I need to check it because I regularly for forget it. But uh, just to, yeah, only angels have wings, right? So this is your your quote, right, from that <laughs> uh, the, the crashing plane, right? You've got quotes from other films uh, by Hawks here, Hatari, uh, for example, right? To have and have not, his girl Friday. You even have headlines uh, about a gangster who appears in, the, in a film by uh, Howard Hawks. And I need to continue very, very fast. So one, one more, one, two more minutes, will it be okay? Uh, and yet another, this one is truly, truly satirical. You'd have to take a look at the detail. You can see how cluttered the space is with all those visual references. And then it becomes complicated. Take a look, for example, at those women here who, I, who are either falling off the planes, right, or jumping off the planes. It's not obvious. Again, it might be uh, a kind of reference to, to, the, to, to the title of the film I mentioned uh, a second ago because one of those women is already becoming an angel, right? So she's developing wings here. But on the other hand, uh, you, will have, uh, you, you will have different versions of, of, uh, of womanhood also shown, uh, shown here. For example, uh, there it is. And then references to very well-known properties, very well-known uh, films, films that exist in the public consciousness, for example, Public Enemy, this, this is an image of James Cagney, actually covered by, uh, by Grapefruit, I'm sorry, <laughs> James Cagney didn't uh, 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 too, too well. And then the funny thing, this, this one is uh, like a borderline case, because here you've got the geometrical patterns, circles, <coughs> lines, rect rectangles, but also uh, these are obviously things that he uh, would have been able to see while going to the movies, right, as a kid, right, so all those candies. But then, uh, if you take a look, those candies, uh, various kinds, I mean, including hacks, right, uh, this, this brand, are contrasted with uh, cigarettes, for example, with wine corks, right? So there is that uh, underlying theme here uh, uh, of, of, of the experience which is uh, both coveted but also kind of impure. And uh, these are the ones that I was supposed to, <laughs> to leave. The last but not least, that, that remark, when I'm writing, I'm usually trying for a language. I have tactics and I know the sound I want, uh, I want and it doesn't read like orthodox criticism. What I'm trying for was a language that holds you, that keeps the person reading and following me, following language rather than following criticism. I love the construction involved in criticism. So again, form, so-called form, 
is of, uh, of utmost um, importance. I would also argue, uh, just to finish concluding sentence, <laughs> I promise, uh, that in this mode of obsessing watching, uh, picking out certain details, I think that Faber has unexpectedly found uh, a huge group of followers, and these are all the fans whose activities you can watch online. This is uh, like, uh, he's coming from a very different direction, but the effect is somewhat similar. Thank you very much for your attention. And no, thank you so much. I, I want to go read some reviews now. <laughs> um, our final speaker today will be Anna Gadash, who graduated from Kyiv to Hoshchevchenko University, Ukraine, where she defended her thesis on American women's drama in 2004. Since 2012, she has been associate professor in the Department of Translation at Boris Grinchenko Kyiv University, where her research interests focus on the critical interpretation of plays by American dramatists. She's the author of the handbooks, Reading and Translating U.S. Women Playwrights, Move Ahead Through Movies, and Move Ahead Through Movies, Part Two. Today, she'll discuss aging artists in Tina Howe's plays. Thank you so much. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you, Sarah, Sarah for such a warm welcome. And it's a privilege for me um, to share with you my findings today. So without further ado, I would like to make it clear that um, I'm going to cover seven points in my presentation today and uh, the, so the shortest one will be conclusions, like two sentences. So um, uh, I feel ob obliged to introduce um, Ms. Ho. Um, among uh, a bunch of modern plays, the credible drama critics Christopher Bixby and Robert Brustein analyzed the comedies written by the modern U.S. woman playwright Tina Howe. Ms. Howe is the outstanding dramatist in the generation of the 1980s, including Marsha Norman, Beth Henley, Wendy Wasserstein mentioned today, and others. A notable American theater historian, Brooks McSnamara, identifies a central theme in Tina Howe's works as the description of wealthy uh, waspdom. McNamara writes, quote, uh, Howe comes from a distinguished Boston family and is well qualified to examine the Fox way or ways uh, of the Eastern establishment, unquote. Regarding the uh, woman playwright style, the British analyst of the American theater, Christopher Bixby, associated in a house writing with the European theater of the absurd. Of, uh, also, Bixby states that, quote, uh, art plays a major role, unquote, in house dramatic heritage. Um, hence, uh, it is no wonder that in uh, Tina Howe plays, uh, protagonists are often artists and art-related persons. Uh, starting from her early work uh, museum and on with painting churches, coastal disturbances approaching Zanzibar, one show, Rembrandt's gift and chasing money, we observe a number of gifted artists who challenge their environment, among them uh, painters, photographers, actors, poet, orchestra conductor, writer, editor, composer, and an architect. Um, in my presentation, I will follow the age dynamics of some characters, artists, in four plays by Tina Howe, derived from various periods of the um, dramatist uh, creative activity. I mean by age dynamics, the critical examination and theor um, theorization of age as a marker of identity in the period of uh, late adulthood. So, suggested by American scholar Sylvia Hernberg, this definition leads to understanding of the elderly age and the process of aging, which are salient in Tina Howe's dramatic tradition. To give just one example, in the introduction to her 1998 memory play, Pride's Crossing, about nonagenarian who used to swim the English Channel, the dramatist argues somewhat, somewhat uh, controversially. Quote, for some time now, I have wanted to write about the passion of old ladies. When men age, they just get older, but women become very powerful. 
it's the female thing that we bear children and nurture the family. As time passes, the membranes between what we should do and what we want to do get thinner and thinner. There is no rage like old lady rage, uh, just as there is no tenderness like old lady tenderness, unquote. The casual reference to aging man is later deftly deployed in House Comedies, the playwright respectfully treats uh, the theme of older men, however, with a touch of mild irony in such plays as one should offer Rembrandt's gift, gift and chasing money. The dynamics of the elderly age is analyzed by the British social gerontologist Mike Hepworth, who defines aging as, um, um, quote, a complex and potentially open-ended process of interaction between the body, self, and society, as well as um, a dynamic uh, process of highly variable change. Aging is simultaneously a collective human condition and an individualized subjective experience." Unquote. Hepworth coined the term aging into old age, which means, quote, a symbolic construct, interactively produced as individuals attempt to make sense of the later part of life, unquote. Analyzing fictional stories of aging, the gerontologist assumes our times to be the most age-conscious period in human history. Uh, in spite of the fact that in Western um, culture, old age has usually been regarded as one of decline by Simone de Beauvoir, uh, Margaret Goulet, uh, Kathleen Woodward, and Mike Hepworth, since the late 1960s, quote, America witnessed a formidable effort to eliminate negative stereotypes of and prejudice toward older people, unquote, writes the U.S. historian Thomas R. Cole, who is not an artist. Um, the attempt to debunk myths of old age together with the implementation of the concept of successful aging, um, explained by Lucille Barron um, down there on the slide, resulted in the new representations of positive men images of later life in fiction. Exploring aging uh, in poetry, the above-mentioned scholar Sylvia Hanberg borrows the poetess May Sarton's image of the creative crone in order to demonstrate that, uh, quote, creativity and senescence can blissfully cohabitate, unquote. Um, in fact, the age psychologists claim that, quote, old age is a time of continued growth and development, uh, as important as any other period of life. And there are many examples of high-functioning, productive older people, uh, among whom uh, one may know such celebrities as uh, Frank Lloyd uh, Wright, who designed New York Guggenheim Museum at age 79, uh, Grandma Moses, who painted at age 100, and actor George Burns, who performed until his death at 100 years of uh, age. Uh, the representations of blissful cohabitation of cre creativity and senescence, senescence excuse me, are also reflected in drama. American scholar Valerie, uh, Valerie Lipscomb is convinced that, uh, quote, among the arts, drama is especially ripe for examining the performance of age as uh, issues of age and aging arise in all aspects of a play, from the script to casting and staging choices, unquote. Uh, one of the first comedies by Tina Howe Museum seems not to deal with age and aging, obviously. Nevertheless, this comedy suggests uh, the intergenerational perspective, which will be the medium for portraying and understanding the age-related theme in other plays by the American dramatist. In a nutshell, the action takes place in the museum, the exhibition by all means postmodern, titled The Broken Silence. Um, is attended by numerous vid visitors, all in all there are 44 uh, of them, mainly young adults. So young are the artists uh, whose provocative wor works are displayed. Um, the uh, most challenging among them uh, are 
four gigantic white canvases, all identical, by fictional artist Zachary Moy. We understand that his works are the brightest embodiment of the metaphor of the broken silence after one visitor's remark, quote, you know his parents are deaf mutes. Can you imagine what it must have been grow growing up with parents uh, who couldn't hear you? They are consigned to absolute and lifelong sil silence, uh, unquote. Uh, whereas some visitors find Zachary's canvases blank and laughable, other guests admire the artist's landscapes, uh, seascapes and starscape. They are done with acrylic emulsion and wax to create salient projections of land, sea uh, or stars. Mm. Um, uh, I couldn't find uh, the examples of um, uh, those canvases uh, because they're fictional. So I just uh, googled and um, tried to to, uh, to demonstrate uh, what what probably could these um, four blank um, gigantic canvases look like. So these are uh, the examples of um, emulsion and uh, wax. Uh, on the right, um, uh, on a blank page, uh, on a blank canvas, excuse me. Right. Um, um, so at a glance, one can see just white uh, rectangles, only with an intent look, one can discern outlines of mountains, waves, or stardust. Probably Zachary Moore encodes his traumatic experience of communication with his deaf mute parents into white, white dichotomy, making the recipients look deeper for the shades, nuances, uh, details, invisible at first glance. In the course of the play, one of the characters exclaims, quote, he chose painting as his voice, unquote. Um, it is important that the final visitors who step on stage in museum are an elderly couple of Mr. and Mrs. Moy, Zachary Moy's deaf mute parents. In front of their son's canvases, radiant with pride and happiness, they speak in sign language. Miss, Mrs. Moy, remember the drawings he used to make as a child, Mr. Moy, the sketches he did of all his toys in his nursery. Mrs. Moy, how wonderful they were, bursting with life, Mr. Moy, noisy with life. Mrs. Moy, remember how he would make the walls shake when he wanted something, Mr. Moy, uh, and how they shook. He shouted with the voice of a thousand men. The lights fade, uh, fade on their rhapsodic hands as the curtain slowly falls. The final scene of the play invokes interaction of verbal and nonverbal. Um, sign language is translated into speech, voice is translated into painting. There is the introduction of such binary oppositions as elderly, young, parents and son, past, present, uh, memories and current moment, conditions of being silent struck uh, by the son, presumably, and image struck by the parents. And it seems to me that the major message Tina Howe explores here is the nature of communication and the role of art in it. Art thus becomes a form of communication and encoded message and not a sense to the public. The denouement of the museum sets forth the issue of intergenerational relationships which on one hand involve stress and conflicts and on the other hand the ways to overcome these predicaments. Nominated for a Tony Award, the Comedy Coastal Disturbances brings the audience to a private beach on Massachusetts' North Shore. Beside the major subject line, that is a love story between the characters of a younger generation, there is a subplot with an elderly couple of the Adams. Now retired Dr. Hamilton, 72, and his wife MJ, 68, an amateur painter, belong to the group of young old age, according to some development. <coughs> Uh, developmentalists' uh, demarcations. Serving as a background to the basic plot, the line of the elderly husband and wife exhibits the models to follow for their younger counterparts. The Adams demonstrate the possibility of living with each other. After all, they have nine common chil children. MJ is good as, uh, at watercolor sketches. These drawings help her briefly convey the current impressions of always changing environment, sea waves, uh, coastline, birds in flight, bathers, beach sand. MJ complains about these instant images. 
Um, it's typical of the senior people not to get rapidly accustomed to, to ongoing changes, but it's, it is crucial to try to do so. Contemporary recommendations for the seniors suggest art as therapy of adapting to new circumstances. A 2010 review by the Oxford Institute of Aging says, quote, why older people, even uh, if they have never been involved in any art before, should not be able to tackle similar sorts of creative challenges as uh, do other adult groups. The participants are often surprised by the quality of their own work, unquote. Although Hamilton, uh, MJ's husband, is generous uh, with compliments on uh, his wife's uh, sketches, um, MJ's relationship with Hamilton are unquiet, often with arguments and even, even accusations. Uh, for instance, MJ doesn't like being watched how she works with her drawings. She stereotypes her own and Hamilton's age, uh, complaining, for example, that um, and I'm going to quote the following um, examples, um, ex excerpts. Uh, Poor thing as death as a stone. Mm, the man over 70 is over 70 and he still carries on like a three years old. Or that they are both a handful of old crocs. U.S. social gerontologist Tony Calasanti writes that aging often becomes an ultimately oppressive process. Quote, other subjects uh, try to avoid uh, the aging process or they lose self-esteem because of the selves they feel they are becoming, unquote. The image of aging woman artist, uh, amateur artist, is rather complicated because the character of MJ uh, represents not only the creative crone but also negative self-stereotyper. Uh, her image is supported by the heterotopia of aging. Thus, MJ is often described by the playwright as home-obsessed, quote, also on the beach is MJ Adams, who has created an entire home away from home, complete with quilted flooring, oversized umbrella, roomy back creaky, reclining chairs, food, cold drinks, extra blankets, unquote. One of the excellent comments on this topic is provided by Mike Hepworth, who thoroughly studied places, spaces, home, and transition from home to the residential care and uh, the residential home in the fictional stories of aging, uh, quote, the home is seen as the most appropriate place for older people and defined in the social gerontology as an essentially private place which is the center of domesticity, a place of intimacy and sometimes a place of solitude. The home is ambiguous. It can also be a prison." Unquote. Uh, I can detect the positive image of late adulthood in MJ's openness to her environment, although she is not ready uh, yet to share her watercolor sketches with people around her. In terms of complexity of MJ's character, I'd like to focus upon her name. It is an, an uh, atherponym consisting of two letters, and it's a kind of encoded sign to describe typical representative of her age, gender, or social status. As an amateur artist, she shows a tendency to overcome age stereotypes, but not always uh, succeeds. Uh, to sum up the poetics of elderness in coastal disturbances, it's worth bearing in mind the ambivalent character of M.J. Adams, who established an energetic and hopeful embodiment of successful aging in drama. Uh, uh, the intergenerational perspective is in the core of another comedy mm, uh, by Tina Hall, number three in my list, uh, that is approaching Zanzibar with octogenarian Olivia Childs, famous artist who used to build fabric mounds and circles in the desert. Although my inner character Olivia Childs is shown an, as elderly professional with positive characteristics uh, open to intergenerational contact. Uh, in approaching Zanzibar, an American family of four, uh, the Blossoms, travel back up from New York to visit their relative, an 80-year-old Olivia Childs, on her deathbed in New Mexico. While working on this comedy, Howe confessed in one of her interviews that she always, quote, wanted to try to write a play that in some way would deal with some of this pain, the bewilderment, turning 50, death, People dying, survivors, how the survivors keep going, unquote. 
The Blossoms talk about their aunt using diminutive forms of her name, Livy and Liv. The image of Olivia is constructed through uh, frequent references to the ant all the way from New York to New Mexico. After a telephone talk, for example, the protagonist and Olivia's niece, Charlotte, reports that Livy is not well. She says, quote, I don't know which I dread more, getting there too late or having to see her suffer, unquote. One of the common fears of aging is the probability of unbearable physical suffering. In self Pity, Charlotte puts on possible options of her own future, either death or grueling illness. Nevertheless, the character Charlotte hopes to see her end alive. In her appeal, uh, quote, to the top of a mountain to fry, fry eggs with Livy, unquote, she metaphorically imagines the end of life as ascend, not descend. The culmination of Ho's reflections on aging is encoded in the final scenes of approaching Zanzibar. The blossoms eventually get to their end. Olivia's room is decorated in the traditions of her evanescent installations. One can feel the duality of human nature striving for the divine and material. The bed, like a ghost cathedral, which dominates the eminent artist's room, is about to lift off uh, the ground, leaving a vase of orchids and an oxygen hookup down there on the table. This binary opposition of exotic flowers and respiratory system leads uh, to the deep appreciation of the eminent life component breathing. Libby succeeds in winning love of the youngest blossom nine-year-old pony. At first, afraid even to look at the old lady, the girl befriends Olivia, recharging her aunt with juvenile energy. Demanding attention and looking for entertainment, Libby rips off her wig to show an almost bold hand, causing child's applause and admiration. Olivia argues, quote, well, a dying old lady's got to have some fun, some fun, excuse me, unquote. Playing and bouncing on the bed makes octogenarian and teenager equal in their love of life. Uh, stay, staying alone with Pony, elderly Olivia is on the age of two worlds. This causes the various dualities of the final scene. The old lady puts on Pony's glasses, as she knows they help her remember, and Pony tucks her head into the ant's wig. A bedpan as a little throne for the teenager makes Livy laugh so vigorously that she has a seizure and puts on her oxygen mask. Drifting back from another world, the aunt retells her niece a reverie that actually happened. Young Olivia is on her way to the um, Sahara Desert, coming across the most beautiful man she has ever seen with enormous bouquet of poppies. Quote, I was always being chased down this long tunnel. I started to scream. Uh, someone grabbed my hands. I opened my eyes. It was him. He had jumped on the train at the last minute and was sitting across from me, eyes laughing, poppies blazing. He didn't speak a word of any language I knew, but he held me spellbound. I never made it, uh, made it off the train. He wrapped me in his flying carpet and wouldn't let me go. You have never seen such feverish carryings on. He rocked me over the mountains, uh, sang me through rainforests and kissed me past ancient cities. Oh, what a ruckus we made. Well, you will do it too. You will do it all. Wait and see. We ended up, we ended up in Zanzibar, island of clothes." Unquote. Lily's soliloquy um, can be um, interpreted as her acceptance of impending death. First, she mentions uh, a, uh, a huge bunch of poppies which have long been used as a symbol of sleep, peace, and death. The enigmatic stranger who doesn't speak uh, any known language uh, may also be a euphemism for death. At the same time, Olivia's reverie is rich in sexual connotations. Um, yes, um, it's underlined on the slide. He rocked me over mountains, sent me through rainforests, and kissed me past ancient cities. Um, uh, thus, Tina Howe introduces the topic of sexuality of the elderly as Kathleen Woodward asserts in um, Aging and its Discontents, uh, Freud and other fictions, quote, anxieties about aging are displaced onto those about death, which are covered in turn by sexual anxieties. 
uh, unquote, the fusion of erotic clothes are associated with protection and love, and thanatic motives creates a deep poetic layer of the play. Besides, sociologists report that the, quote, there are no uh, known age limits to sexual activity, unquote. Well, uh, I understood that I have to finish, but I have like mm, several minutes more. May I have them? Thank you. Um, uh, if in uh, early plays, by how old uh, eld adult uh, characters are mentioned episodically, the protagonist of Chasing Money, this is the last play for today, is 80-year-old is, uh, 80 artist Catherine Sargent, now legally blind. A permanent resident of a nursing home, Catherine is firmly determined to get out of what she calls the funeral home. The home is uh, an e exemplar of the crisis heterotopia defined by Michel Foucault as a, quote, privileged or sacred or forbidden place reserved for individuals who are in relation to society and to the human environment in which they live in a state of crisis, unquote. However, the French philosopher argues that, quote, these heterotopias of crisis are disappearing today and are being replaced, I believe, by what we might call the heterotopias of deviation. Those in which individuals whose behavior is deviant uh, in relation to the required mean or norm are placed. Cases of these are retirement homes that are, as it were, on the borderline between the heterotopia of crisis and the heterotopia of deviation, since, after all, old age is a, is a crisis, but is also a deviation, since uh, in our society where leisure is the rule, idleness is a sort of deviation. Catherine um, Sargent, um, who used to be a, um, a relative of the famous American painter, is absolutely impressive and powerful person with ribald sense of humor. In the exposition scene, uh, Catherine is shown in depressive mood, and in contrast to Rennie, her new roommate, a live lactogenarian woman in the early stages of dementia, wheelchair bound. In the run of the play, Catherine and Rennie makes friends, make friends and successfully escape from the funeral home chasing freedom, respect, dignity, and money. His, uh, the luncheon on the grass serves an animating force of the play. Uh, first, a large print on this canvas floats over Catherine's bed, where she usually lies with her face to the wall. Second, um, under the influence of Manet print, on one sunny day, Rennie would revise her intimate relationship with the deceased husband. Quote, I did that once. Took off all my clothes outdoors just last week, uh, as a matter of fact. Herschel and I were having a picnic at the lake. Uh, I was so hot, I thought I would croak. I uh, 115 in the shade, so I stripped. Then Herschel stripped. You know, men, they like to fool around. Well, who doesn't? So there we were, stuck naked, chasing each other in that delicious cool water. There is nothing like doing it underwater. And she emits a series of sexual grunts and uh, groans, unquote. Um, and um, the, this moment of stripping clothes symbolizes freedom and power, uh, of which the elderly are often deprived, at least in literary representations. Catherine's powerful and artistic character is um, also revealed through her son's cue who says, quote, you never look before you leap. You just run to the top of the precipice, spread your arms and whoosh you are airborne, leaping into the void, unquote. This verbal portrait conveys the artist's image at its best. With the help of her roommate, aging Catherine, uh, succeeds in getting out, bound for Paris, chasing money. And uh, the last few sentences in her comment is Tina Howe studies and subverts stereotypes of aging through the construction of artistic characters who offer new opportunities for the elderly. The dramatist ma message echoes Sylvia Hannesberg's idea that age and aging should be understood as a public responsibility that requires certain kinds of action and certain kinds of art. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And can we have just one more round of applause for our four? <laughs> we have perhaps a few moments if there are questions. Um, I'll turn the floor. Yes. Uh, 
Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask Anna about uh, many fathers' politics. Um, I guess I was particularly interested to hear that he was writing for um, The Nation and The New Republic, which are obviously um, relatively liberal magazines. Um, so I guess what I was really interested in is kind of the reviews that he's writing, how much do they stick out? Are they very unusual um, in contrast to the other reviews that are usually written in those magazines? Um, is he in some way perhaps by you know, ignoring the fact that many of these films are entertainment and somehow just discussing them in an art sort of context, is he somehow elevating their status to an art level, if you see what I mean? Well, I don't... I don't think, uh, feel qualified to answer your, your question. Uh, from the reviews I read, I don't think that uh, he, that you can actually extract a political agenda or a awareness of the, let's say, context. I think that what, what strikes me about those reviews is essentially the fact that he's interested in the, in the visuality of, of films. You know, films exist films are interesting because they are visual, right? And that seems to be the, the point of, of, of departure. Uh, at the end of my presentation, I, I made this comparison uh, between you know, fans watching films obsessively and Faber watching films for, for those small pleasures, small details. But I think that in a sense, it's not a valid uh, comparison uh, because I think Faber is interested in films as if these were like landscapes uh, you know, uh, in their visuality, whereas fans obviously watch uh, for, for, for slightly different agendas. For example, uh, the actors that they uh, that they love, right, or or maybe the, the the genres, right. So, so that is the extent of uh, of my answer uh, to you, really. I'd, I'd, he doesn't really strike me as a as you know as someone who has definite ideas as to the politics of the movie, uh, non-visual politics of the movie context context-bound of uh, politics of the movie. Thank you. Other questions or comments from the floor? Anna on Manny Farber. Where did he teach? You mentioned he taught. Uh, Yeah, 1977. And he, he taught in an art school? I can't really he taught in an art school there? Oh, I think at UCLA. Uh, so he had, a, he had a, a pretty striking course. Apparently, you know, some of his students became later on film reviewers, but he was a very unorthodox teacher, you know, showing obsessively, you know, fragments of films, uh, you know, sometimes showing them in reverse order, so it was kind of... And then, uh, you know, wanting, uh, that's what I read, wanting students to actually be, be able to, to draw storyboards for certain scenes as part of their exams, you know, final exams. And this, this I find particularly interesting. You know, I'm thinking, uh, you know, let's do some storyboards with students and they will probably die of, <laughs> of, of the exertion. So I, I forgot to add that uh, some of the reviews uh, were uh, written together with his with his wife Patricia Patterson, uh, but the the book I have, you know, this huge collection of of, hi of his reviews. Actually, you don't have that information, so I don't know whether the the the, the collection by Polito actually groups only his reviews, uh, his own reviews, uh, or just uh, you know omits the issue of authorship uh, uh, as far as the wife uh, was concerned. So. Pause a moment if there are any other questions for our panelists. Yeah, this is for Anna about you know, this aging process and this metaphor, which is uh, very strong in theater. And I must say it's interesting what you're doing in a sense because uh, I have in mind two um, uh, examples of uh, how gerontocracy has really is becoming uh, a big theme in theater, contemporary theater, in love, love, uh, love's love bleeding by 
Dan De Lillo, there is an actual uh, you know, old uh, um, artist uh, and, uh, who is dying and is uh, really dominating the scene and this is, is much more powerful than those surrounding him. And uh, in uh, Tony Kushner's Hydrotafia, which is actually a rewriting of uh, Thomas Brown's important prose poetry, there is uh, once again, you know, a big uh, authority who is dying away, but is still imposing his conditions. And my question is, since also this idea of senescence, which is also very strong in uh, contemporary poetry, the last, uh, the last collection by uh, Grace Pelly, Fidelity is exactly, you know, devoted to that, you know, all, you know, aging and also love, uh, you know, during the aging process. Don't you think that rather than discussing uh, the, this period of time in human life, uh, they are really referring to uh, more metaphorically about a certain stage of our world, you know, a kind of uh, uh, a moment when, you know, there is maybe it's a turning point when some, something is really uh, going to end and, uh, and preparing, as Grace Pelly says, uh, like a kind of uh, new humus for uh, something which comes afterwards. Don't you think that it's also a metaphor of a, a certain, uh, you know, cultural tradition uh, and also geopolitical idea of what we are that is really dying away? Uh, it's very strong in the theater and also Marsha Normans really, this, you know, just uh, in interestingly portrays that. And, but I, I, you know, I'm just wondering, you know, from the methodological point of view, if it's really the case of insisting so much on a kind of age uh, uh, issue about, you know, you really human beings at large, or rather, you know, picking that as a kind of metaphor of what we are and what wow. we are going through and uh, how to survive that or how to relaunch it, you know, into the future. Yes, th thank you very much for this uh, extended comment and um, the names you also mentioned. Um, um, uh, what, what, what I try to do, um, because I'm in the beginning of uh, uh, developing this subject of understanding what is it, uh, what, uh, what I try to do is to see uh, how, how the, uh, the process is represented in literary images. Um, so far, I can, uh, I can state that um, um, there, are, um, there are like two, two major um, segments you can rely on. These are either images, uh, and uh, the, the first one is images, the second one is uh, the description of the process, which is uh, almost absent in drama uh, texts, in dramatic pieces. Right? Uh, you can find a lot of, um, um, a l really, uh, uh, a big number of novels in contemporary British and American um, literature. And uh, I'm pretty sure that everyone um, has, uh, everyone has no, everyone in the room uh, knows them. Um, uh, you see, the um, well, the project is really um, uh, ambitious but vague at the moment, so I cannot say exactly about methodologies. Of course, there are uh, there are different. Um, descriptions, descriptions, representations. Some of them may be metaphorical, poetical. Um, on the other hand, um, recently I uh, tried to uh, work to understand what uh, ageism is and how it influences, the, how it impacts um, this um, uh, stories, these stories of aging. Yes, so, uh, in order to understand ageism, for example, you need to, uh, to um, 
uh, study some political, social, um, gerontological uh, papers. Uh, so, um, on the one hand, it's um, um, it's a kind of um, mm, not scientific research, but um, social, so to say, in in broad terms, social research. On the other hand, if to uh, to stay in only in poetics, um, probably. Um, you, you will not understand the implications, the implications which are, which form, which form these um, often negative uh, stereotypes, um, which uh, go back to the ancient Greece, to Euripides, uh, Sophocles, um, Aristophan, Menandro, and um, well, uh, each uh, each playwright tried to either mock or um, well, I don't know, to show negative, negative in negative terms, um, either the character or uh, the this later part uh, of life. So I don't know whether I <laughs> answered your question or not. But um, um, well, any comments, <laughs> any feedback? Well, I think um, at this point we will say thank you very much for your attention, <laughs> and I wish you all a very pleasant evening. Good night, thank you.